Hello once again friends, neighbors, and fellow Christians, and welcome back to another video in this series where we are debunking the typical objections that are raised against realized eschatology. I uh, apologize for being away for so long. Um, just uh, through the winter time, uh, my allergies are just, they're unbearable. I get up in the morning uh, most of the time with a busting headache and uh, so much drainage and I don't want to bore you with that. But anyway, um, by the time I can overcome that and then go to work and come home, I'm exhausted. So anyway, uh, it just has not been able to, and I'm not going to waste your time uh, when I don't feel like that I can present something that is uh, interesting to you. So anyway, uh, we're back, and the weather seems to be breaking. We've had a couple of beautiful, just glorious days uh, with the weather, and uh, so thankful for that. And hopefully, uh, my allergies are letting up uh, some, and of course, then we'll have the pollen to go through uh, here in not too long. But anyway, um, if you watched the last video, if you haven't, please go back and watch it. And notice the things that are pointed out there, and, and believe it or not, there are still folks that are that are doubting that Peter in Second Peter chapter two and three that he is quoting from the Song of Moses, among other places like Isaiah sixty-five and uh, some uh, Psalms uh, ninety uh, that we pointed out, and even some other places uh, where he is quoting from the Old Testament and prophecies. Uh, specifically telling his audience, his Jewish Christian audience, the diaspora, uh, that uh, he is reminding them of the words that were spoken by the Holy Prophets. But anyway, um, I, in the previous video I showed you, and we'll look at this, I showed you how that here in Second Peter 2 and verse 1 that Peter is quoting from Deuteronomy 32 and verse 6. Uh, when he refers to those that deny the Lord that bought them uh, and uh, uh, bring upon themselves swift destruction, which is an echo of what we find in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 20. And then as we go down in the text, we find that in verse 13, he again is quoting from the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5, uh, referring to uh, the spots and blemishes there. And then when we went on into chapter 3, we saw that he again in verse 14 here is again citing from the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5. But now uh, there's one that I overlooked that I want to share with you, and that is in verse 7, right here. When he says that the heavens and the earth, which are now, again, that's Peter's now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Well, that is being cited from verses 34 and 35 of the Song of Moses, where he says, uh, Is it not laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Again, uh, the content, the context of the Song of Moses was posited uh, in Israel's last days. So these things would come upon them. And, and Peter, there, there's no doubt about this, and, and the ironic thing about this is, I learned this from reading a, from reading a futurist commentary. Now, now, just get the irony of that, that Peter is quoting from the Song of Moses. Now, what I want to share with you uh, in this video is some more things that we find and we learn from uh, the Old Testament here. And um, I want to uh, take you and, and I want to show you and compare, lay in parallel, um, chapter 2, some of the, the portion here, some of the context of Second Peter chapter 2, and I want to put that alongside the writings of Jude. And if I can figure out how to set this up here, and hopefully this will be readable to you. You might have to enlarge the screen. I had to, uh, to do a little scrunching here to get all of this 
text in one slide. But anyway, reading from Jude, beginning in verse 6, he says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Well, that's what we see in verse 4 of 2 Peter 2. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and that's Tartaru there, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Peter goes on and says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Which is what Jude says, Next, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, uh, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Rather, Jude says this in verse 7. Then we compare what Peter says in verse 6, which is parallel. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example, an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And Peter mentions Lot there that was uh, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, uh, seeing, dwelling among and seeing uh, their unlawful deeds. It vexed his soul from day to day. And Peter says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And this is the same day of judgment that we just read from chapter 3 and verse 7. That they, are, they were reserved, kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now notice this. Jude goes on and says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Well, these refers to the ungodly men who deny the only Lord God. That's in verse 4 of Jude. And that is parallel with verse 1 of 2 Peter 2, denying the Lord that bought them. Okay? And as then as Jude says, uh, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Then Peter says, chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Jude says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Peter says, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Jude says, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Peter says, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to write in the daytime spots they are and blemishes again quoting from song of moses sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you now there is no question that jude and and second peter 2 are dealing with the same context and i don't know of anybody in the churches of christ that doesn't uh, agree with at least this principle, that uh, they run parallel, that uh, Jude and, and Peter are speaking of the same things, okay? But I guess you have noticed that I have omitted a verse here of Jude as well as of Second Peter, and we want to look at that verse because these texts are parallel. Now notice, okay, Jude goes on and says, these are spots, as Peter said here, spots and blemishes. These are spots... And this is the same word in the Greek. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, uh, carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withereth, uh, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, wage, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So again, this shows that the, the context is the same. Both writers have the same thing in mind as they are writing. So now, we notice the omitted verses. 
Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and did not bring an accusation against him, did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, in all of my growing up in the church, this uh, was taught as being uh, Satan wanted to know where the physical body of Moses was buried. Now, why? I don't know. I don't know the reasoning behind that. But what would that have to do with this context, folks? And we'll show you here in just a little bit that Jude is quoting from the prophets, just as Peter is quoting from the prophets in chapter 3 and reminding them of what the holy prophets said. Uh, and Jude is quoting here from Zechariah chapter 3. And I want you to notice that he says that Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Okay? And Peter says, Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them. Do you see that right there? Them. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong thing here. But anyway, uh, I was trying to highlight that, and that doesn't work in uh, PowerPoint. Okay, but against them before the Lord. So again, these verses are parallel. And this demonstrates that the body of Moses is in the context of what Peter is talking about. Do you see that, folks? You need to let that sink in and you need to let that percolate for a while because this absolutely, categorically, destroys the idea and the theology that Peter is predicting the end of the material creation in chapter 3. Peter is quoting from the Song of Moses. He is quoting from Zechariah chapter 3 here. And he has the body of Moses as the context Quoting from the song of Moses. He has the body of Moses because these verses are parallel. And then Jude goes on and says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. Well, that's what Peter said right here. Upon all to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But you see, I want you to notice that, again, the context are parallel, okay? And Peter has the body of Moses in his context here of setting up the pattern. Again, that's what we would established in the previous video that Peter was establishing the pattern uh, by using and referring to the analogies of the destruction of Noah and his cosmos and then of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he uses the same pattern of destroyed by water, destroyed by fire. When he comes to chapter 3, the Noah's cosmos was destroyed by water. And then he says the heavens and the earth that are now are reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. Right here, same thing. But this is, with, this is in the context of the body of Moses. You see that? The body of Moses. And I have a little bit more show, so, to say about that and show you as we go on. I'm going to read a little bit more here from Jude. Okay. He says, These, and that would be these ungodly men, denying the Lord God, and this actually would be the body of Moses, Old Covenant Israel. Okay. These. These are murmurers, complainers, walk, now notice this, walking after their own lusts, and their, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Peter says in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. How that they told you that there should be mockers. Well, that's the same word in the Greek that's rendered scoffers. In 2 Peter 3, when Peter said that they are walking after their own lusts. So again, this shows the, the, the texts are parallel, exactly parallel. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 
and now notice this, and have compassion, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and now notice this right here, and of others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, notice that, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now notice that I have these color coded here in blue. This is in blue because it's parallel with this. And this is blue because this verse and this verse is quoted from Zechariah 3 verses 1 and 2. And Peter, excuse me, Jude here creates an inclusio, a bracketed conversation, a bracketed discussion in which he opens up here by quoting from Zechariah 3 and he closes the bracket here by quoting from the identical text and that means that everything in the middle here in between the brackets pertains to the body of Moses. This makes the judgment predicted by Enoch applicable to the body of Moses. This rules out this uh, the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints as an event in our future because it's applied to the body of Moses. Now, just as a side note, and you can take this with a grain of salt, okay? When we think about that Jude here quotes from Enoch, and he says the seventh from Adam. Um, escape from my things here. And if you have the opportunity, and you can do this free, it's online, you can read from the book of Enoch, and it's, it's not very far into the book, uh, to where this is predicted here, when you find this, and what is astounding about this is that when Enoch says this, when Enoch predicts this judgment, he says that it would be in the 70th generation. Guess where 70 generations from Enoch puts you? It puts you in the time of the apostles and the generation of Jesus in the first century. Now again, I said take that with a grain of salt. But this is unquestionable that Jude quotes Enoch. Okay? And when you go back and read Enoch, that, that's what it says. Okay? And that, that's why I say, the more I study, the more things I find that just fit together like hand in glove, like putting a jigsaw puzzle together, the pieces fit perfectly. And I have yet to find the first detail that contradicts uh, the view of realized eschatology. Now, I said, when we looked at that in blue, that he is quoting from Zechariah 3, and that's where we want to go. We want to look at uh, Zechariah 3, which says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Excuse me. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Does that sound familiar? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And you can read, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's, it's not very long. Uh, just ten verses. But you read that chapter and you study that. Okay? But this is where uh, Jude is quoting. Uh, the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee. And uh, Jude interprets that as the body of Moses. Do you see that? He interprets Jerusalem in, in this here as the body of Moses. And when he said, and others say, pulling them out of the fire, he is applying this right here. Okay? So anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you. And um, I hope that you will take the time to uh, look at these things with an honest heart and that you will 
study these things with an honest heart, with an unbiased heart, and just allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, okay? I mean, that's the way that it was intended to be. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so it is our job. The Scriptures tell us, lay, they, it lays the burden upon us to rightly divide the Scriptures, okay? And the only way that you can arrive at the correct exegesis of a text is to allow the Scripture to interpret Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, Scripture upon Scripture, etc. Okay? That's the way you arrive at the truth. And I wanted to show you that, and as I said, within the context, the, the underlying foundation uh, of uh, Peter's epistle there, especially 2 Peter 2 and 3, you have the body of Moses in the context. Old Covenant Israel. And uh, speaking of the body of Moses, let me show you this, uh, because this was something that we never were taught uh, growing up in the church, was the body of Moses. Now, we, we have no problem whatsoever comprehending the concept of when we are baptized into Christ, okay, Galatians 3.27, Romans 6, verse 3, that we are baptized into the body, okay, the body of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, we are baptized into the body of Christ. But I want you to look at this right here, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, moreover, brethren, I would not, and let me take you down here so you can read this. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now notice he says, all our fathers, that's old covenant Israel, okay? And they were all baptized unto, now let me show you something. Unto is a little Greek term, preposition, I believe it is, ice. And that is the same term that is used in Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. And uh, in Romans 6, verse 3, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, that's the preposition ice there, Galatians 3 and verse 27, is the same term. So it is the identical terminology in the Greek. Baptized into Christ, baptized into Moses. Okay? So, as I said, this is something that we were not taught, or if we were, I was asleep. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we weren't taught this. But that's what the language says. And Old Covenant Israel was the body of Christ. And that's why we say that when Paul is teaching uh, about Israel, he uses all of this corporate language. Okay, He doesn't speak of individual biological bodies. Uh, he speaks of a corporate body of many members. Okay, And we see this, and we see the body of Moses. And as I said, uh, Peter points out that that those things were in the process of being dissolved there in verse 11 of chapter 3, okay? And it, he has the body of Moses in the context there. And as I said, this completely refutes the idea that 2 Peter 3 is dealing with the end of material creation, okay? Now, I thank you for your time, and I hope that uh, you'll tune back in uh, come back and watch the next video because if all things go like I have it in here, uh, then I'm going to show you just how powerful this argumentation is. Okay, uh, and we'll uh, we'll look at some reactions uh, to these things. And I've shared these things with some, uh, even through email, 
and uh, it's just it's just remarkable to see the deflection and uh, people just they don't know how to handle this and that's it's sad that through the decades that we have not seen these things and that we have uh, it's taken so long to come to the knowledge of the truth but when we have an honest heart and when we look at these scriptures in context okay context context is king okay we have to look at these things in context and that's when these truths just jump off the page at us so okay uh, I thank you for your time and uh, I pray that you will uh, like and share these videos uh, with your friends uh, if you're not sub if you're new to the channel not subscribed please subscribe to the channel and again share this these videos with your friends and encourage them likewise to subscribe to the channel and to share uh, these videos with their friends and let's let's spread the word and the good news that God is a God of truth that he does not lie he did not lie it is impossible for God to lie and he kept his promises and he kept them on time okay and he is a God of his word he is uh, he, <laughs> he is a man of his word so until our next video may God bless you in your studies of his holy and divine word and you have a blessed evening.